So talking about fans and loving them again, we have to speak about this. So this article is courtesy of Mixmag regarding the one and only Fred again. And he's been getting absolutely panned online. And I'm kind of in my, um, what's that word called? I'm kind of in my um, red bar era. I'm feeling a little bit red barish because everybody's panning Fred again and going in on him and making him a bit of a meme um, for privilege and all this sort of malarkey. It's kind of making me think, you know what? If everyone hates him, I might start being an unapologetic flipping Fred again fan just to kind of rewrite the flipping or to kind of rebalance the scales because I feel the criticism against him is just so over the top and so unnecessary. And in general, it kind of really avoids or kind of dismisses or really doesn't focus on actual problems in the industry especially in dance music that need to be addressed like i mentioned at the beginning of the show like how do you go from being a bedroom dj to playing a fabric what is that process why is the process so flipping difficult and nonsensical and doesn't you know what i mean and kind of you know so different for different people and there's no real clear path like why are they only booking certain people to play in these kind of festivals right Re representation some of the people say but never actually deliver on and when they do deliver on it it's too heavy-handed and dismisses the idea that you have to be good at what you do in order to kind of get these spots <coughs> Sorry, I'm getting a bit freaky chucked up here. Not really, but anyway, why are artists releasing stuff like Nini H Rude, for instance, got all these flipping amazing tracks online on Spotify on you know streaming platforms, but not getting paid for their work? Why are festivals so expensive? Why are the ticket prices for clubs so expensive? Why are certain places in the country not able to have late licensing deals or whatnot to allow people to go and rave in certain places? All these things are very really more important. Why is Amy Lammy still have a job? Like these are more important than whether or not Fred Again's parents have a blue line under their flipping names on it. Don't get me wrong. Fred Again's background is insane. Legitimately insane, right? Like I, I've only kind of been checking it really because of the article about Fred Again. And I'm quickly going to post it up on here and kind of get up on the screen. But it is legitimately maybe the most privileged um, background I've ever seen of any artist ever. Really, he might be one of the most like legitimately <laughs> privileged artists I've ever seen. So let's not discount that. And I'm no, you know, you check his name, you go on this flipping Wikipedia, you see he's only 29 years old, um, you scan down on his wiki, you see his family listed here in his early life, and you see that he's the son of a King's Council barrister, right? So barrister, barrister, sorry, Charles Anthony Wanford Gibson. And he's uh, and Marianne Morgan, members of the British Peerage. And um, he's a grandson of aristocrat and financier Shane O'Neill and Third Baron O'Neill and British Alistair socialite and Fleming, right? Um, who later on wanted to marry a flipping Bond, the creator of Bond. So clearly, guy comes from immense privilege. Cool, whatever. All right, cool story. Anecdotally, let's move on from that one. But I just feel like the article itself and how they're kind of trying and how people are. Uh, pan in this mix mag article it obviously it comes from a place of it feeling like payola which it does and i think business business teshno highlighted it really well big up business teshno definitely my favorite um electronic music platform in terms of spreading some of this news and getting it out there but i feel like they did a really good job of sort of like highlighting it right and i think it might be this post here let me just see if i can get it up on here bear me one second um no i think not i think it's this post so it's this it's, it's a number of posts so they post on here business techno regarding the whole issue the first post they posted on the instagram mix mag and co trying to really hard to convince people that fred again is some sort of working class guy and another one they've got a really good post here from mix mag regarding this article they did writ regarding um J what you call it fred again and they use three different headlines right and it's got it here in the caption miss mag has 300 and 334 thousand followers on twitter they posted the same fred again article three times post one got 27k views post two with a caption that is far more um that's far from reality that is at least misleading got half a million views and post three um with a normal fact based on caption got 4k views um mix my cover feb um cover feb equals uh, 7.8 views as mentioned before it's not really about fred again success or upbringing despite the latter playing a role in the success yesterday if people don't want to see why people are not happy with mix mag and coverage it's okay but don't come here and pretend everyone is just jealous and hating on fred again so this makes my statement and as you can see here from the captions they've got different captions from mix mag's twitter about how they're promoting the article written in different ways um the, the first one reads fred again may not 
not have droves, may not have droves of crying teens waiting for him at JFK, but his rise from little lone label producer to selling out arenas in under three years and the fervent dedication shown by his fans is a phenomenal on itself. The second one says, Fred again, the appeal is that he is whoever he wants to be. He, he is whoever you want him to be. He is the guy you smoke rollies with. He is the one pouring you pints. He's inviting you over to his house to play some tunes. That was one of the most successful. And then, of course, the third one says the apparent spontaneity of Fred again uh, means that um, fans wanting to have the real experience need to, stay, need to stay engaged with his social media near constantly with those pursuing the right minute able to get their hands on the secret tickets so obviously those points are you know they're 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 based on some sort of fact and i understand it and like i said before payola is always annoying especially when people pretend it doesn't exist it's kind of like that saying don't piss on me and tell me it's raining that's the annoying part of it so people will pretend like the guy's growth has been somewhat organic but let's not also discount what role pr has played into his success and maybe being signed with a certain label a certain representation a certain booking agency all these things are going to contribute to you being successful but for whatever reason these people in these industries especially if you listen to or watch flipping ims lectures and stuff like i do like an idiot from the ib for music summit you hear people from clubs from publications from booking agencies telling you this fanciful story about how to make it when the reality is a little bit more nuanced a little bit more heavy-handed brown envelope lace than they'd like you to believe it to be so they kind of make it seem as one thing and then when it comes to his background i also understand how some people can look at it and think hey he's not working class why are you trying to make it seem like he's one of the lads when he's not really one of the lads right he's one of the fucking dukes he's one of the chaps do you know what i mean he's not one of the lads at all i I completely understand it and i think that's also a faux pas for every reason in society especially in the arts maybe because it was always an an outlet for the unrepresented unrepresented um downtrodden working class people to kind of get their expression out there and to kind of tell their story that's maybe an intrinsic part of it for whatever reason people of privilege go out of their way to hide their privilege and sort of distance themselves from it a good example I can think of from my experience is Dash Snow, one of my favorite graffiti artists and a real mainstay figure, a legendary figure of the New York art scene who unfortunately passed away with a heroin overdose. He was very well known to be someone that came from immense wealth, but did it was always a secret. He didn't really want everyone to know. And he also distanced himself completely from his family, completely cut himself off. And I think the only person who had access to him from his family was an aunt or a great, great aunt or something who was really kind of tapped in with street culture and kind of loved it all and was basically there to kind of help Matt Weaver needs to do but he went out of his way to say hey I'm rejecting this and I'm embracing this life of you know um, you know shoplifting and graffiti and streetwear and living this amazing New York um, artistic lifestyle and just kind of living that kind of life he kind of didn't want to be a part of it so I understand that kind of tension if you do grow up in privilege for me I've never seen the issue with it um, I feel like if you have privilege that allows you to, to do what Peggy Goo did and essentially you know find yourself in Berlin and go on a world tour and then eventually end up being a world famous artist i think that's amazing but don't hide the fact like you know in peggy goo's case don't hide the fact that your dad's a fucking ceo of fucking samsung that's not that just there's no point in hiding that because eventually people find out it and it'll make it it'll make senior origin story a bit weird and people will kind of have odd impressions around it but i just want to highlight the article itself i feel like is people kind of miss kind of read it because i feel like it's a real kind of um love story to fandom and being able to connect with people because a part of Fred Again's success also, you have to be said, was timing. Was the fact that somehow his songs and his tracks connected with people during the pandemic. And loads of people in this article are saying the same thing. And if you watch the boiler room that he did recently, oh no, the one that was most famous, the one that's got like it's maybe a million views, I'm not really sure what the views are. But watch the video. Boiler room in London have usually got a reputation of being pretty crap. People don't dance a lot. There's a lot of kind of, you know, posting up and watching each other, criticizing people's outfits and just trying to be too cool. But that was one of the many, that's one of maybe a few London boiler rooms in recent years that I've seen where people were absolutely losing it. They were having the bestest time. And most of the people in the crowd that were going crazy or in and around Fred again looked very young, 
loads of rosy cheeked kids, right, that looked maybe in their early 20s, maybe even teenagers, absolutely loving it, being in the midst of one of their favorite artists and having the time of their lives. So clearly, Fred again has fans that love what he does. It's not all just payola and uh, PR machine and all this malarkey, but it did play a role in it. So it's kind of too far, but I feel like people just dismiss the fact that he connects with his fans and he's clearly able to kind of talk to them and communicate them in a way where they love and appreciate him in a whole different way and they've basically propelled his career the fans have you know um, Mix Mag can write as many taglines and tweets as they want but you know Mix Mag can't get fans to sell out Madison Square Garden they can't get you know Mix Mag can't make you buy tickets essentially you still have to be a fan to kind of go and buy them so I guess this article does a good way of kind of describing it right it's in, in certain parts here um, let's continue here and says um, yeah this one despite just being one stop of the producer's first world tour with the third um, actual life still being packed in pressing plant um, shipping boxes the demand for tickets to catch him at the 5,000 capacity South London venue with over 4 46,000 people attempted to get tickets for just one night according to those who tried because I guess they'd probably get them from ticket swap right these are statistics it became a meme on social media fans documented their joking but not jokingly willingness to trade their firstborn to pay three times face value or even give out sexual favors in order to secure a spot the quote I panicked thinking I wouldn't get tickets when the European gigs were announced. Georgie Atkinson, 26-year-old student studying at the University of Cambridge, tells me. I bought emergency um, tickets from Paris Date. Happily, I managed to go to one of the Brixton shows, but I would have been more than happy to potter across the channel to see him. So people are willing to travel to parts of Europe to go and see this guy press buttons on an NPC machine and go crazy behind the decks and stuff. Like, this is what he does to people. Like, clearly... The guy has found a connection with his fans. The people are now talking about whether or not his, his dad has a fucking, you know, blue line or URL link on his name. That's not important, really. I don't feel like study maybe how he's been able to connect with his fans in this way. But also acknowledge, yes, the media machine has helped. Yes, maybe the ability to, you know, do what you want when you're growing up and have Brian Eno as your fucking neighbor can maybe spearhead your career. But still, Brian Eno can't make kids especially gen z kids that don't even know who fucking brian Eno is they can't make them buy tickets they can't make them get euro stars they can't make them jump on the ryanair to go see someone play it doesn't work like that um it continues the proliferation of fred again isn't limited to europe either north america has its own share of extreme reactions there were reports of tickets for his recent tour going for five hundred dollars can can even solomon command that kind of fee solomon's fucking popular in dance music people love ricardo villalobos people want to suck on jamie Jamie Jones is schlob. People like Seth Truxler. Michael Bibby is quite popular, but I've never seen people trying to sell a ticket to see Michael Bibby play. I sold that show in Printworks for $500. That clearly shows that people love and appreciate what he does. So I feel like the the privilege thing and the upbringing thing really dismisses or really kind of, kind of turns away the idea or kind of just loses focus on actually what he does really well, which is obviously produce music that kids love, they connect with it and they want to push it forward, clearly to some regard. Again, it's not for me. The whole voice notes thing I find really, really insufferable and a little bit disingenuous because I don't think I've ever left somebody a voice note in my entire life, especially telling them a story, let alone a voice note. I'm just not that guy. So the fact that these people are out there going around like doing fucking walkie talkies on their phone where you could just call somebody, I find that quite idiotic and then using those things to kind of make tracks is dumb but let's not lie when you first heard that track with um the blessed madonna talking about the pandemic that one that he kind of produced i forgot what the name of it is and it first played don't get me wrong when you first heard that you did get some feels i know i did it sounds a little bit boring now and it kind of didn't really you know it didn't age well but when that first dropped let's not lie that that, that shit hit let's not lie it continues um along with his new best friend skrillex and fortet sold out surprise show in madison square garden in just four minutes on the other side of the planet a secret pop-up rave in melbourne australia early this month is reported too just imagine the m image of fortet skrillex and fred again selling out madison square garden you know how awkward those three guys look People used to get people used to take the piss out of ben ufo how about awkward he looks ben ufo just looks like a regular english dude if you don't know what English guys look at, he's just like a regular English dude. Fred again, especially Forte. Do you see how Forte looks like? He's not selling tickets based on his looks. That guy's not Harry Styles. So if people are turning out and selling out in Madison Square Garden for those guys, and even Skrillex, right, who's kind of stuck in 2005, they're going there because they love and connect with their music. It might not be for you, but I feel like the dismissing of them as artists because you know you're not into it or because like i said before their parents have urls on their names it's just weird to me it continues um 
da, da, da. it's admittedly extraordinary that somewhat groundbreaking reaction to an electronic producer with unmistakable underground inspired sound again we need to relax with all this stuff um, then Fred again hasn't had any ordinary rights I promise born in London but educated in a prestigious Wiltshire based boarding school so again it's mentioning his privilege here and Fred again aka Fred Gibson spent over a decade in classical music before becoming a protege of seminal ambient artist and family friend Brian Eno when he was 16 years old so let's not lie about the thing right but born in some level of privilege maybe having access to things that more people don't have access to being able to brian you know fucking brian endo makes a big sense makes a big difference but again pull some bits apart here the thing that i feel like really kind of stands out and why this might be something to really kind of hone in especially for dance music he's somewhat classically trained and I feel like for me, thinking about some of the best producers out there in the scene, most of it has this come to do this idea of like being multifaceted and not just relying on just one sound, which you're seeing a lot with these kids now with this hardcore sound of it sounding kind of trite and kind of boring, even house, even techno to some regard. And why it sounds really trite and really boring and it lacks in groove is because I feel like a lot of these guys are pulling from the same reference points, which is just other techno records that were created. Very rarely are you hearing them talking about listening to R&B, hip hop, country, pop um synth pop electro whatever it may be it's all very genre concentrated it's all very locked in on the genre if i listen i don't listen to anything else where i feel like the best musician and artist no matter what genre they're into or what they made were into everything i think of the immediate thing to me comes from um you know quincy jones lo loving flipping stravinsky right classical music like and it you know and being kind of connected with how that connects with your left brain and your right brain and the emotion of it of course if you're listening to stravinsky maybe that kind of knowledge and that education can lead into you also being able to produce, you know, a flipping legendary album like Flipping Thriller for Michael Jackson. That can also inform it. So of all this kind of privilege that's been said there, maybe the ability to be born where he was born allowed him to, you know, the ability to kind of access to certain things. But the lesson to be learned here that people can pull nowadays, because you can't let him, you can't rewrite his history or go back into his mother's womb. But what you can pull from this is like, hey, this guy that's been able to make really, you know, um, genre defining electronic music of our times that connects with Gen Z kids and just people in general is that he's also somewhat trained in other genres, classically trained, has a different understanding of music maybe in a quick analytical sense whatever it may be that may have informed how he makes music in dance music that might go some way that's really important too maybe the fact that he can read music all that sort of shit that kind of buys into it but again because he's rich or because he comes from privilege doesn't matter it continues his first credits came in 2014 as songwriter on brian Endos. <laughs> okay it's funny to do this it's like, Jesus Christ becoming an alumni of the Red Bull Music Academy in Tokyo in the same year um, from there he found success as a producer in the mainstream music world and working on who's um, who are the chart success including this is early on before he even started flipping making dance music he was working with Little Mix Ellie Golding BTS Rita Ora Westfield sorry West Life sorry Westfield with Charlie XCX and Clean Bandit the list goes on in 2019 Gibson also was involved in the production of the 30% of the UK number one singles <laughs> and later earning Gibson the Grammy nomination for Song of the Year for the Colossal Bad Habits. However, simultaneously, Fred again began working on his more underground um, solo project, kicking off a Rinse FM residency in September, um, but it's much later on in the front of lockdown that Gibson dropped the first full-length solo record, Actual Life, and with it, a diehard fan base was born overnight. So, not really an overnight success, a kind of a long time coming, but that musical education he's got early on definitely played dividends. Let's not lie. Let's not flip and lie, right? Um, it continues here. Uh, that's really a story about some guy that he's got. Uh, another one here. This one I like. What the fuck? The then Tony producer uh, stammered over the London um, to Victoria Park. I don't know what's happening right now during his Mixed Mother cover interview um, three months later in November 2021. Gibson described the experience as a very tense due to the technical malfunction on stage, explaining that he's now familiar, humble tenor, that we've kind of got away with this because it's built on the tension. I just force quit in front of however many thousand people. Um, this, the, the discernible modesty has become synonymous with Gibson his loyal supporters have enamoured with his down to earth public persona as his music and I'm just hoping I hope for the love of God that his public persona that he's got is also what he's like in, in private because for whatever reason I don't know what it is about dance music and I've said it plenty of times before even myself being an up and coming DJ and wanting to do this professionally sometime in the future and having aspirations of opening my own club I don't know why, what it is about dance music it's it, especially DJs it's on the lowest frunk of the entertainment ladder it's the easiest thing to do 
but for whatever reason the people that make it are the biggest pricks the biggest cunts the biggest bitches um the biggest pieces of shit the biggest fuckers in the world like whether or not they're a dj or they're an artist or they own the club you meet so many wankers in this scene that it beggars belief and the funny thing about it is that we all start from the same place doesn't matter where you're rich and poor or you'll start from going to a shitty club somewhere seeing somebody that's either really good that inspires us to try or somebody that's really shit that inspires us to do it that's that's why we all get into this we either get inspired or we think i can do it better but we all start from the same place being ravers and for every reason people suddenly forget that and as soon as they become really popular and they become really big they kind of turn into absolute monsters and i hope for the love of god that this fred again guy isn't that dude and he is as you know as kind of awkward and quirky and that kind of you know camera tism stuff that he does i don't even know if it's real or whatever it may be i hope that's all legit and i hope he is like that as he comes across the interview as sweet as he does as calm down to up as he does because you know i've met many uh, people from privilege who are really nice people who really got their way to be super super lovely and i've also met people like complete cunts but i hope that's a fact i hope he's not a monster like everyone else is behind the scenes um and it continues um in lieu of the cool collected approach to promoting usually seen in the underground electronic music acts again don't use the word underground of him please the guy was making hit records in 2019 man like oh, come on and um, fred's initial gig run following his debut has characterized a fan participation this is where i get where business of fashion is coming business or fashion business tech show is coming from this constant little signaling that he's underground that it's a scrappy story it's like annoying because it's not true the actual true story is still inspiring. You don't need to keep forcing this idea that he's underground to us is a nonsense. The guy was, you know, fucking songwriting with Brian Eno when he was 16. Like, come on, let's let's relax. You don't get stuff for free, but also let's chill. Ahead of his string of UK dates, um, shows in early 2022, Gibson has asked fans to suggest local venues that were important to them before inviting them along to the surprise show at Hackney Night's Tales. Jesus Christ. Imagine him playing on Night Tales. That must have been packed alongside High and Romy. And High's got a really good story as well about how um, they made it as well. So big up High. Um, uh, his subsequent tour was illustrated not by slick shots of cities where he visited, but by submitted videos from the dance floor to camera monologues expressing his enthusiasm, sorry, astonishment at crowd turnout and even at the show in Milan helping someone propose to their partner. I'm sorry, but this guy sounds lovely. Let's be real. He's actually like the amount of DJs that I've met in real life or spoke to in DMs who are absolute cunts is really high. That's why I go out of my way not to speak to them and just kind of enjoy their artistry because it's really difficult if you have one bad interaction with somebody, even if it's like they've got a reason to because they're tired, they don't care, they, they've got big, whatever, people got their issues. But having one bad interaction with somebody can really taint how you look at them. So I try not to do it, avoid it. And most DJs anyway, don't really like communicating with their fans. There's many DJs out there who get asked for tune IDs on a song that they release. They don't reply to comments. They don't even double tap shit. They leave you unseen. Like horrendous interaction with fans at all. It's just really a kind of like, I, I provide you the music, leave me alone kind of, kind of conversation. This guy is probably more famous than all of those guys combined. And he still has time to do all this stuff and to be this nice. I hope it's not performative. I hope it's legit, but he does sound lovely. Let's be real. Similarly, when promoting his albums Actual Life 2 and Actual Life 3, fans were given the opportunity to vote which tracks would be released, posting rough wavs, asking which um, would be preferable for videos, given to, giving to the minute updates and sharing Zoom and FaceTime calls of his collaborators. Come on, brother, this guy is fucking legendary. Meaning that they had uh, tired of projects were coming out. Many fans were not only invested with the material, but felt a sense of partnership in the musical process. He just seems like a genuine, normal guy, says 29-year-old Joe and he does especially when you consider he's what like look at his background if you had this kind of background if i had this kind of background i'd be a fucking tyrant i'm sorry i'm a tyrant his dad's a fucking a barrister for the fucking royal family king's council in the united kingdom and in some commonwealth countries a king's council during the reign of terror of king of king or queen's council during the reign of queen is a lawyer who typically a senior trial lawyer technically appointed by the monarch country to be the one of his or her majesty so basically it's their kind of lawyer lawyer residence that's what he does was if my dad's a lawyer in residence i'm acting all kinds of way you know that right and he seems to be pretty decent so let's give him credit and give his family actual some props for raising a guy who despite his crazy privilege is somewhat well adjusted <laughs> that's a big deal in my opinion personally for me maybe you guys aren't thinking any different but i think it's different 
Um, it continues here, normal guy. Um, Project Man for Tooting said, "You can tell that he shows that he's appreciative of the love he's shown from the crowd, and it's appreciated repro and repro reprocitated. Repro how you say that word? Reciprocated, reciprocated, whatever it's word. Um, which itself creates an amazing atmosphere. He just comes across as somebody that could be your pal. Enjoys the Guinness and has a spectacular taste in music. When did becoming someone's pal and enjoying Guinness become a privilege?" what do people drink that live in fucking broccoli do they drink fucking pims every day or some shit like i'm sure people in broccoli drink red stripe i'm sure some of them drink um what's that drink with the black with the x on it that's fucking awful like you know beer's universal having a couple of lines is universal having a couple of dabs is universal dropping a couple of pills is universal <laughs> the fan focus interactivity of fred again projects seem to be paying off in the live set of coachella last year um held in the beginning of his stateside takeover as the tour was going on when the tickets went on sale his debut show three years later many sold out in minutes back in europe a thousand strong crowd in Barcelona Primavera festival seemed to sh seem to shook even Gibson showing footage of an apparently endless sea of dancers during his set at a copper stage. And again, big up him also for cultivating a fan base at dances. I've seen videos of Peggy Goo. She's at a level now where her success and the celebrity is too much, where people are legitimately just coming to film her. It's quite sad, to be honest, how it must feel to be Peggy going to all these places, flying first class, you know, staying in the best hotels and then going to play to in front of your fans and just seeing a, f a, a sea of phones and no one dancing. Like Fred again at least cultivate the fan base where they legitimately turn their back to him and they're having the bestest of time. They're just happy just to be there. They don't need to be right in front next to him. They don't need to be behind him. They just need to want to be in the presence around other Fred again fans. That's absolutely incredible. I don't know how you do it, but he did it really well there. So big up him. Um blah blah blah. blah. He says here, um, this time last year, I hadn't played a live show yet. This is mad. Behind the scenes, Gibson was also preparing for a release of Actual Free, working with the all-star cast of Fortet, Rico Nasty, Flo Dan, Skrillex, and Swedish Half Mafia. However, despite an uh, atypical approach to growing his fan base, it was a traditional tried and tested method of producer on the rise, promoting a new record that would have catapult Gibson from Dance Music Favorite to Household Name, a ballroom set in July 2022. Filmed in the East London Warehouse, Gibson set featured mostly production cuts and drumming furiously on a sample pads as a horde of mid ravers grew um through gun fingers and round him that was the first time i actually saw him perform that video of a boiler room instantly i knew i didn't like the music i thought it fucking sucked but the faces of the people around him i was like wow this guy's a star like that genuine emotion and passion and enthusiasm and love especially in london it doesn't come easy like we're harsh critics over here like we can we, we are the biggest haters in some regards so the fact that the fans connected that well to it, i thought okay this guy's definitely got something um it was a perfect partnership a typical diy platform renowned for its unpolished presentation of dj sets and productive crowds and the approachable rough and around the age of superstar producer within 24 hours the set had racked up a staggering 150 000 views and has now surpassed 15 million views the tracks used in the mix shot up in the charts with sweetest matthews collaboration would turn out the lights again oh that track is so good featuring future turn out the lights i'm looking for oh no that's a hit the guy's the guy's got bangers he's got slaps okay url parents with urls or not um reaching tw number 21 in the uk meanwhile spotify reports that while fred again's releases had been steadily rising around one to two percent of the month in 2022 and um, the following ballroom set in july um uh they rose by 50 percent and august by 89 percent. so again the same people criticizing him are also the same people who dismiss f fucking Boiler Room's influence. Boiler Room is, you know, they've got their they've got their faux pas. Some of the stuff around the funding and whatnot is very very sketchy, and where that money went to, and some of the collaborations and who they've been sponsored by and whatnot suspect. But let's not get away from the core of it. As a platform, they have launched and boosted up so many careers. It kind of beggars even kind of belief to kind of catalog them all like what they've done for people it changes people's lives instantly so big up boiler room for all this faults and stuff they've done a lot for the scene for sure and even people they've got faults people just kind of correct them i think whore berlin wouldn't be what it is now if boiler room didn't exist right they see what they did wrong and then they do it right in their way love it the set um sprouted thousands of memes tattoos and halloween costumes and even making a star of the crowd member rodney who after inadvertently turning off the music halfway through the set due to some sort of enthusiastic dancing was the subject of an entire reddit investigation to find his identity a title subject with over 5.4 million views and even a sports banger t-shirt aptly named rodney rod again 
So all that's all good, yeah. But on the other side of things, you've got um, platforms like Business Techno not really too happy with the kind of you know the the shoving down of the throat of him, which I completely understand, and then um, just kind of posting a different comments of other people in, in the scene talking about the kind of reception of Fred again which I can understand in some regard this is from Dweller the really influential festival out here so so in America um, you know that's kind of spearheading and essentially reminding people of the roots of dance music um, especially when it comes to techno and house and whatnot and they've actually got a night coming up in Bergheim which is incredible they've got an entire flipping night that they're programming in Bergheim that's just full from top to bottom of flipping black creatives and black artists black DJs it's fucking fantastic so big up Dweller and obviously I'm a fan of Frankie and what she did with this woman and you know like look at this woman you want to stick that this woman got earlier on and now look at all the festivals that we have now that are particularly kind of catering to certain communities and whatnot like ugh, they really did they didn't get enough props when they were around anyway it continues the dollar said as follows dollar account need to make an observation that the biggest magazine dance music primarily dj mag and mix mag did not write anything about this year's dweller festival not even an announcement an all black electronic music festival you'd think that would be a low-hanging fruit to cover but alas next slide um, as also the key to add that the festival was our biggest ever their coverage doesn't dictate the success of Dweller which is fucking sick by the way but only reveals that there is very little vested interest in covering underground culture ramblings and more interest in covering the opposite and that's why I said earlier about the Fredigan article say what you want about him he's good or whatever the upbringing I think is a bit over the top but this idea that the guy's underground is insulting really insulting to our intelligence like even if i do a command f and i search underground like how many times have they said underground this guy was making hit records when he was 16 years old do you know what i mean like let's just not look look how many like there's 11 instances of the word underground being written on this article regarding fred again and he is nothing of he is nothing close to underground whatsoever he may work with some underground artists but his upbringing or his education or no education but his kind of rise in music and his popularity has not been based on being underground whatsoever it's been based on being a musician a music head somebody that kind of um has been classically trained in all the right ways and was able to adapt and use that knowledge and passion and information and talent and basically be able to kind of pour it into dance music but the idea that he's underground is insulting so i definitely understand that part of it um and then if you see this one the final comment they made because i think they're getting some stick blowback from people commenting and saying the privilege doesn't really matter um the final comment from business techno was at the end of the day it doesn't really matter because resident advisor mix mag and co know what they're doing nothing will change as long as these platforms are led by people who are ignorant towards black and brown culture and also keep hiring staff who don't really care yeah fair enough that's a conversation we need to be had um i still think you know business Tesla does a very good job in terms of spreading this and making this you know known and they're probably way more influential and important to culture anyway than the ra especially since ra has kind of gone you know by the by and removed comments and has went in some weird direction i still think these guys influence culture way more the berlin uh, and you know ofc account that t covers um, Berg kind of stuff all those pages are way more influential to culture than RA in my opinion even in Mixmag um, even though Mixmag does a good job of covering the high and low I don't think they're actually influencing culture as much as people think they are in general I think it's more of an industry kind of thing but I also understand the frustration that a lot of people feel when they feel like it's kind of heavy handed and being poured down people's throats and stuff about his upbringing and how he come down up or how he grew up and whatnot because at the end of the day um the privilege does kind of count it does sort of matter but it doesn't i don't think dictate how somebody's been able to be successful going through and going onwards with this sort of stuff but there's no denying there's no denying where's the flip there's no denying that the guy and the guys around him are incredibly awkward behind the decks and the lack of wheel ups or the the the, un the inability to wheel up a tune properly is probably Fred against greatest crime next to the double dots next to at the end of his name which i fucking hate you have to always type fucking fred again with a dot dot it's fucking obnoxious as fuck like stop it just call yourself fred again there's no need to fucking double dot stuff but regardless of that it's kind of reminds me of like asap rocky when he came about and you know the s was always a fucking dollar sign like allow it it's it's pronounced asap and you're spelling it with a double dollar sign with a, like come on especially nowadays you're in your 30s like allow the dollar sign that aside this video um for, was it feb, feb 17th from this account called uh 
Gazia is hilarious. It features Skrillex and um, Forte and Fred again behind the decks. And Fred again attempts to wheel up a track with the most limp-wristed wheel up I've ever seen. Like, I'd hate to see what he looks like throwing a ball, like or a cricket ball or kicking a ball in general. It must be horrible to watch, but the wheel up is so bad. <laughs> Probably off his head on pingers, bit of cat. And look at the wheel up. Oh, so bad. Fortet with his ghoulish face looking like, please, brother, allow it. Yeah, so that wheel up was terrible. That's probably his greatest crime ever. And um, Fred again should never be allowed behind the decks again um, if he's going to wheel up a track like that ever again. But I feel like the criticism and the kind of vitriol around him is too heavy handed and it's just too much at the end of the day. People are going overboard and they're kind of, you know, kind of you're losing focus on what the actual issues are that are really laid in dance music from representation um to diversity to lineups being all the same to ticket prices to just uh, like i said before in the beginning of this of this segment how do you go from being a bedroom dj to djing a fabric what is the path and why is it um that the path for the most part doesn't seem to be somewhat clear and why is it that the industry seems to cater and favor certain people and just kind of regurgitate the same lineups again and again and again it's just annoying there's loads of different things that need to be kind of looked at and the fundamental point of it to end it is why has Amy Lamy still got a job those things are way more important whether or not fucking Fred Again's family are flipping rich or not because I feel like regardless of if they are um and just regarding his upbringing he was always destined to be a success anyway because his education has been fucking sublime it's been probably the most ideal right you don't have the pressures of having to work a regular job you've got all this amazing inspiration behind you Brian Eno's your fucking neighbor access all the best equipment you make hit records when you're super young um you get involved in the industry you, you know how to navigate that side of things and now you're kind of stepping you know out from the shadows and being a star yourself but the education and learning from other people from being in the studio is already there that kind of sets you up to go in a good way again not his problem not his fault but obviously that's a big deal but still he connects with the fans the fans love him that mixed mag article is literally a love letter to flipping his fandom the overuse of underground is annoying and they're clearly trying to spin it a certain way but that's just journalists being journalists so never trust them or talk to them but the kid definitely has fans definitely has people that love him and for the most part i feel like the criticism around him is really really excessive and over and and too much it's going overboard for the sake of it and maybe it's because people feeling you know confused inadequate um and just annoyed that another kind of you know typical white dude the way he looks the way he looks um has made it despite them kind of grafting and plugging away where they are i understand that's giving me frustrating but that kind of energy and frustration needs to be poured back into the arts in some way or maybe different conversations need to be had but not it shouldn't be personal it's not really his fault it's the system that kind of facilitates and allows those kind of things to kind of thrive that needs to be attacked and not the person itself in my opinion because i think the person clearly connects with people you look at that boy in the room those those kids that are there are not crisis actors they fucking love what he does he connects with them they connect with him they sell it out like you know who's reselling fucking dance music events tickets for 500 dollars on fucking ticket swap that's insane i mean even michael bibby doesn't do those kind of numbers like that's nuts so clearly the fans love it if the fans love it respect the fans don't dismiss it and kind of if you don't like it just turn it off no big deal